In this video, we're continuing to talk about evaluating limits algebraically, and we'll look at case two, which is the non-zero over zero case. So the general setup is we're trying to evaluate the limit as x approaches a of f of x. And if we plug in, because remember, we always start these algebraic evaluations by plugging in. And doing that, we get a fraction with a non-zero number on the top but zero on the bottom, then we will evaluate the one-sided limits. Moreover, it'll turn out that these one-sided limits, these one-sided limits, let me just abbreviate and write limbs, will either be positive or negative infinity. So it's just a matter of figuring out, well, which one are they? All right, so let's look at an example. This is example two. And because in the previous video, we did example one, let's evaluate in part A, the limit as x approaches two of x squared over two minus x. So remember that the first step is we always plug in. And if we plug two in on the top, we are gonna get four, because two squared is four. On the bottom, we get zero. So we have a non-zero over a zero, which means we now take the one-sided limits. We take the one-sided limits. Okay, so let's take the limit from the right, and then we'll take the limit from the left after that. So from the right, we get the limit as x approaches two. I put a little plus sign in the exponent to indicate that it's from the right of x squared over two minus x of my function. And now let's break down what it really means when we say that x is approaching two from the right. So if I draw a number line and I put two on it, when we're saying that x is approaching two from the right, that's saying that x is getting close to two, getting really close to two because it's a limit and the other part of it is because it's approaching two from the right-hand side, that means x is bigger than two because we are approaching two from this side, from the right-hand side. And on that side of two, x is bigger than two. All right. So with that in mind, I'm gonna take another kind of crack at this limit, but now I'll be a little bit more precise when I plug in a number for the denominator. So for the numerator, there was sort of no issue with plugging two in. I got four, and there's no problem with having four on the numerator. On the denominator, I gotta be more precise. So on the denominator, we know that because x is approaching two, we're getting something kind of close to two minus two. So the denominator is close to zero. And we now know that x is a little bit bigger than two. So it's like we're doing two minus, like something a little bit bigger than two, that's kind of like, like two point something, something, something. And when I subtract that, it'll give me an overall negative number. Something really close to zero, but overall it's negative. So the notation I'm gonna use for that is I'll write zero, but I'll put a little negative sign of the exponent. And that'll mean that it's close to zero and it's negative, it's smaller than zero since x is greater than two. All right. So now, what is, some, what is something, what does this equal? What is four divided by something really close to zero, but negative? Let's look at a couple of examples to explore this. So what if I had four divided by like negative 0 0.001? If I rewrite the denominator as a fraction, we get four over negative one over a thousand. And when you divide by a fraction, that's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So you'll get four times negative 1,000, which is negative 4,000. So notice that the whole uh, result has become pretty big. Like it's a large number if I just see the 4,000 and there's a negative sign in front of it. Now let's do another one of these, but let's make the denominator even smaller. So I'll do four over negative 0 0.00001. So we have four of these zeros. So this is four over, if I rewrite that denominator as a fraction, I will get negative 
1 over, so I've added two more zeros, so this should be 1, 1, 2, 3. I used to have three zeros on the bottom, now I need to add two more. And then when I do the same multiply by the reciprocal thing, I get negative 400,000. In total, I think there's five zeros here. Okay. So in general, what we're noticing is when we divide by this fraction, the fact that this fraction is so small, it's so small that multiplying by the reciprocal makes the result huge. And that's what we're seeing here. So overall, 4 over 0 with a little negative sign should be a huge thing. But, they're the, but it's negative, because I had negative 4,000 and negative 400,000. So we will say that this is negative infinity. Uh, whoops, I actually don't want to box that because I'm not done there. That was just the limit from the right. I need to now do the limit from the left. So let's, let's do that. So the limit from the left. All right, so from the left. Let's do the limit as x approaches 2 with a little negative sign from the left of x squared over 2 minus x. And as before, let's break down what it means for x to approach 2 from the left. All right, so I'm going to draw a number line. And I'll put 2 on it. And if we're approaching 2 from the left-hand side, that is this side of 2. And on that side of 2, x is less than 2. So now let's plug... Let's plug in, but more precisely. I know the numerator is going to be 4. There was no issue with that. But on the denominator, let's be more precise. I'm actually doing 2 minus a number that's a little bit smaller than 2. I'm actually doing 2 minus something like 1.99, you know, really close to 2, but smaller than it. So my denominator is going to be really close to 0, but it's going to be a little bit bigger than it. I'll write 0 with a little plus sign. So this notation, 0 with a little plus, will mean our denominator is close to 0, but, or maybe let me say and, and, and it's positive now. So for the same reason as above, when I divide 4 by a really, really tiny number, something that is super close to 0, that's going to make the result huge when I multiply by the reciprocal. And then it's just a matter of figuring out the sign. I know it's some type of infinity. I know the top is positive. I know the bottom is positive, which means the whole thing is positive. Alrighty, so at this point, I know the limit from the right was negative infinity. The limit from the left was positive infinity. So our conclusion is since the one-sided limits are different. Since the one-sided limits are different. That means our limit that we cared about, the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared over 2 minus x, that limit does not exist, or I will write d and e. All right, let's look at another example. So part b is asking, what is the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of e to the negative 1 over x to the third? All right, so remember, we begin by plugging in. So we're not even going to worry about the fact that this is a one-sided limit first. Let's just try plugging in. And if I plug in, we get e to the negative 1 over 0. So I am getting a non-zero over 0 thing happening. It's just happening in the exponent of this e. All right, so now... Typically, if we saw something like this, this exponent, it would mean do the one-sided limits. But our limit is already one-sided. So this is already one-sided. Let's just consider what side it's coming from. Already one-sided. So there's no need to do both sides. I just do this one side. Okay, so I'll draw my number line. X is approaching 0. And then from the right, so that's from this side, which means X is a little bit bigger than 0. So I'm going to practice using my notation, that 0 with a little plus sign or 0 with a little minus sign notation. So when we plugged in, it actually should have been. So it is actually 
e and then to the negative one over, and then I should have written zero with a little plus sign because x was actually a little bit bigger than zero. Alrighty, so we're gonna get e to the, and I know when I divide one by something really, really, really small, it's gonna make the result huge, and then it's just a matter of the sign. The negative sign in front of this whole thing will make that a negative infinity. And now I need to know, well, what is e to the negative infinity? So this is a good time to do a, a review of the graph of e to the x. All right, because that's going to help us. So let's do a brief review. So y equals e to the x. All right. And while we're at it, let's also do y equals ln of x. Let's review what these two graphs look like. So I'm going to draw some axes. Draw some axes. And I'm going to ask you to pause the video for a quick 45 seconds and see if you can draw these two graphs. Four, three, two, one. Pause it and see if you can remember what these two graphs look like. Alrighty, so hopefully you did that. Hopefully you paused it for about 45 seconds to try to remember what these two graphs look like. So remember y equals e to the x, that's that exponential growth graph, which starts here, kind of asymptoting in this direction to the x-axis, and then it starts to really rise more, more and more quickly. This point where it crosses the y-axis if I didn't remember what it was, I could plug in x equals zero. And if I did that, we'd get y equals e to the zero, which is one. So that point is zero comma one, and that's my graph of y equals e to the x. y equals ln of x is the inverse of it. So these are inverses of each other. And the graph of ln of x, it crosses the x-axis at one comma zero. When they're inverses, the x and y values get switched. So zero comma one becomes one comma zero. Alrighty. And the graph of ln of x will look something like this. This one has a vertical asymptote at the y-axis and then it kind of curves upwards like this. Alrighty, so now that we've done that brief review, let's return to our question, which is, well, what we need to know e to the negative infinity, which means in the graph of e to the x, we need to let the exponent the x go to negative infinity. That is way, way, way over here on this graph. x is going to be going to negative infinity. And as it happens, the outputs of the function or the y values get super, super close to zero. So this equals zero, and that is our answer. So I want to end this video with a key graphical observation, which has to do with the fact that if we take the limit of a function and as x approaches a from the right, if that limit is positive or negative infinity, and or if we take the limit as you approach a from the left, and that limit is either positive or negative infinity, then the graph has something uh, going on at x equals a. Before I say what that is, I think it's going to be helpful to motivate it with an example. So let's draw a picture where the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of a function equals infinity. So let's draw some axes. Let me draw x is 1 here. So as we approach one from the left-hand side, the y values, the outputs, are going to infinity. So that might be something like, so as you approach one from the left-hand side, the y values gotta get really, really, really big, go to infinity, that's something like that. Let me, maybe let me put an arrow here. And it looks like that what that's creating is a vertical asymptote. There is a vertical asymptote. All right, vert asymp here, vertical asymptote at x equals negative one. And that's what goes to fill in this blank. Then when this happens, if either of these one-sided limits are some type of infinity, positive or negative, then my graph has a vertical asymptote. I'm gonna fully spell it out, vertical asymptote at x equals a. In this case, all it takes is one of these one-sided limits being infinity or negative infinity. It doesn't matter what's happening on the other side. So maybe on the other side, maybe I'll put a hole here and then I'll have the function going that way. It doesn't really matter. The fact that one of these sides was an infinite type thing created that vertical asymptote. So in terms of our goals for this section, we've talked about how to handle case two when we get a non-zero over zero when plugging in for a limit. And remember, our strategy there was to evaluate the one-sided limits. 